my name is Lorez Bailey. As you can see, I'm the publisher of the North Bay Business Journal. And what I just want to start out by saying, you know, thank you for those of you that do this work. I think what we realized in our conversation, for many of you, the work has chosen you. You didn't choose the work. I think we'll have a new generation of young people who will come up and choose to do this work, but we know a lot of you did this work out of um, either being directly related to the fires or finding an opportunity to find a role in it. And for me, it's been really just um, exciting to watch Jennifer's trajectory in this work. And one thing I know that's at the core of her work is empowering communities, not coming into communities and trying to tell them how it is and how it should be, but knowing that each community is identifiable in its own uh, separate way and how do we empower people to be resilient and survivors and then be on the other side of how we can be proactive on the other side. So it is my joy to be here a second year and to moderate this conversation. So first, let's start with our introductions. We have Jen, Kate, and Michael. You can see. So why don't we start with giving you all an opportunity, Kate, since you're the closest to me, um, and just introduce yourself and talk about the work that you do. Um, so my name is Kate Scow-Smith, and I have a really long title, Disaster Case Management Systems Facilitator. It still is a mouthful for me. <laughs> I've been doing this work for since the campfire um, in 2018. Um, I'm also a campfire survivor myself. I lost my home in um, Megalia, which is just above Paradise in the burn scar. Um, I'm a social worker by trade, and at the time of the fire, I was doing home health um, work in um, where most of my clients were in the burn scar. And um, dis I had never done disaster work before, <laughs> so um, it was all new to me. But overnight, my caseload um, of about 35, the majority were um, campfire, impacted by the campfire, most in, mostly in skilled nursing facilities. So um, I took a few days off for myself, uh, navigating the fire, and then I was just really drawn to return to the, to the work. And um, I always felt like my recovery was somehow tied to understanding the recovery in the, the larger sense. Um, so, uh, so my role was created to, um, it, it was identif we identified the need, it was, there was about 10 agencies uh, kind of signing up to do disaster case management. And uh, the supervisors and other partners involved in case management identified the need for a role to um, kind of facilitate the, the case management system because as you can imagine, it's um, challenging to integrate 10 different perspectives from organizations on how case management should happen, like right down to the intake form and what questions should be on there. Um, so we identified the need to have a neutral party to kind of um, facilitate those conversations and create spaces um, for people to connect. Um, so that's what I do. Um, I um, oversee the case management system. Hi everyone, my name is Jen Cowish. Um, I'm a trustee for the town of Superior, but I didn't start this journey uh, in that position. Um, I do not have a fire background or disaster recovery, so um, my background's actually a military and I've, I've been overseas in the Middle East for quite a while doing um, refugee relief. Um, so one might say that there's some obvious connections there in terms of um, recovery situations, but um, nothing uh, like what a, a mega fire does to your community. So um, I think for me, it just started with, uh, they put the fire out directly in front of my home. So my home is still there, um, but all of the homes across and, and neighbors and friends of ours, their homes were all gone. So arriving back to our community, it was easy to see, I'm gonna help the person in front of me, which turned into helping the block and helping the neighborhood and helping the, the entire community. Um, which has now led to um, uh, running for office and being in a position where I think I can actually make, um, at the local level, policy decisions that can help the fire survivors immediately. Um, and joining Jennifer as well in DC, I have a, a, a very big, um, uh, I really like going after legislators and pushing them to, to do stuff, more resources, more money. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I got here. Um, during the recovery process, we started an organization called Superior Rising. Um, and as Kate was mentioning, being a neutral party that wasn't the government, that wasn't the residents that are fatigued, 
Um, so we we were essentially the communication piece uh, for for folks to to know where they could get information, get resources, and then in turn we could take their needs back from the the block captain um, model, which was shared. Um, directly back to whoever could do something to help those folks. So um, over the last, I think the fire was in December 30th, 2021. So it's been almost two years um, and we've just, we're still working on it, so. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, good to be back here. Michael Mortar, State of Oregon. Oh, that slipped. I'm not with the State of Oregon. I am from the State of Oregon. Um, like many here, uh, I didn't choose the path uh, to help on disaster recovery. Uh, it found me. I, I'm a 30 year public servant covering two states, uh, Oregon and Alaska. And Oregon, the bulk of my service was with the largest regulatory agency in the state. And you don't think you're gonna say, hey, I wanna grow up and be a regulator. But I worked for very innovative leadership and I had a series of roles that really helped set me up for success uh, ultimately in wildfire recovery. So I worked for the Oregon Insurance Commissioner for four years when we had a lot of really heavy duty battles and crises uh, going on. And I was Switzerland between the trial bar and the insurance industry. So made it out of that, um, jumped into the state building codes division where I created and ran a statewide outreach and dispute resolution program. And then my last big block of time with that agency was uh, helping rebuild a disastrous health exchange rollout. So. Um, Round two in Oregon was successful at that point. Uh, that said, uh, come September, sorry, August of 2020, I made the decision. I had two years of service left. I'd go back to my roots in the uh, legislative branch uh, working for the insurance commissioner and our fires broke out. And I literally had reported to work all of one week at that point. I went to the emergency command center. I'd never been in one before. I'm looking at hundreds of people from Red Cross to FEMA to swimming into the deep end of the pool and um, was able to make my mark there uh, after a couple days and met with leadership at emergency management and they said, uh, this is not a job rotation. You're not going back uh, because you've got this background that can really help us. Uh, Governor Brown at the time appointed Matt Garrett, our state wildfire recovery director, and that was a very innovative move. So when we talk about social capital, this was really important because it was created from scratch. Uh, Matt knew of me, but we'd not worked together, um, but he looked at my background and asked um, if I would write my job description. So that's how we came up with wildfire recovery ombudsman. And that was to really hold state agencies accountable uh, in the process. So um, thank you. Thank you for the purpose of our conversation. I just wanted to define a couple of things in the title because I think it's gonna help ground our conversation going forward because I really wanted to understand. So when we talk about a resilient social contract, we're referring to a set of implicit and explicit agreements, norms and expectations that will govern the relationships and interactions between individuals, communities and their governing institutions. And that has some things that we've talked about and we'll talk about a bit here today, like flexibility, inclusivity, protection of rights. We called out trust a lot in our conversation, legitimacy and being accountable. And how do you sustain this work, right, over time? And then what is climate resilience? It refers to the ability, or at least this is what ChatGPT says, so if you wanna correct me, blame AI. Uh, but refers to the ability of individuals and communities and ecosystems and systems to withstand and recover the adverse impacts of climate change or fire or any major disaster while continuing to function effectively and adapting to those conditions. So really the strategies aims to reduce the vulnerability of these impacts and build capacity to bounce back and thrive in the face of adversity. So with that, can each of you, and I'll start with you, Michael, I've also been told by some people in the audience I can give you a hard time, but I promise I won't. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> um, but let's just start with, you know, share your perspective on what you think a resilient social contract means to you and in your work. Yeah, I think what was eye-opening for me was the deployment of a lot of federal resources, both from the Red Cross at the national level to FEMA coming in and that whole recovery structure was, response structure, was very top down. And 
being someone entirely new to this process, that's, I felt like we were missing the local connective tissue. And that was something that was really important to me in that role was, all right, I, and I understand we have to do certain things in the recovery process, but we have to meet the people where they are and we have to build trust and you have to earn that. You can't just show up and say, I'm from FEMA. I'm going to be here for three weeks. Trust me and call it good. Sorry if there's anybody from FEMA here, but that's what it felt like. So um, I think really meeting people where they are. I, I couldn't agree more from a from a different perspective. So before I was in the role that I am in now, the first year of our recovery, I was just with the people. I was a resident working with residents and, and holding community events where we would come together. And I think the biggest piece of that resiliency contract of, of um, creating the trust was I'm going to keep showing up even if they don't. I'm going to keep providing resources even if they need to get it four times because they, they're, you know, their trauma minds just can't absorb the information. Um, and we're going to keep finding creative solutions to, to fit whatever the need is and, and going back for more and more. And I think there has to be an expectation of that from them before that trust can come that you really are going to show up and you really are going to keep um, working whatever the systems are, that you really are going to take the information back to FEMA or back to SBA um, to try to, you know, we got small gains in streamlining some of those things for our residents, and, um, which were huge wins for our community. Um, so I think um, that that is the the foundation of um, what ultimately became, a, you know, a, us being a trusted source of um, information for them. And then Kate, what's, what's really nice about this conversation is the different aspects that you guys hold in this work, right? Michael, we talked more about architecture and on the hardscapes kind of things, but those all have an emotional uh, connection, right, to that. Jen, we talked about how not only being um, a survivor yourself, but you worked in local government, so you have that aspect. And now we have Kate who worked as a social worker, so I'm sure it means a little bit different to you also. Yeah, um, uh, that's where I was going to go is more on a micro level. And I think what's really important is to um, make sure you're creating a system that's going to um, integrate the needs of the population you're serving. And we knew like in Butte County, um, we're one of three counties in California that have the highest adverse childhood experiences um, that survey ACEs. Um, more than 70% of the population has had at least one adverse childhood experience um, in their lives. And prior so, to prior to the fire. So wow, that's really yeah. significant. So can can imagine you do that, that stat that again? What was that statistic again? <laughs> Set, over 70% of the population has at least one adverse childhood wow. experience. Wow. Um, and so just with that alone, we also know that this is a population that already has a lot of distrust with ser services and um, probably has not had good experiences with services. So um, uh, another part of that was as a survivor myself, it was one of the first times that I actually had to use some of the services available for recovery. And it was a really humbling experience to have to be a helper that's also receiving help. And so that gave me a lot of perspective for like, you know, what we were going to need as a system to recover, um, where people could, again, feel that sense of trust and safety. And we were, I knew we were going to have to do something creative and different, um, to make sure that people felt that sense of safety. So, um, I would like to talk about what are those significant challenges and vulnerabilities that communities face in the light of climate resilience and the soft infrastructure. And um, it kind of goes back to what uh, Jennifer was saying. Okay, here we had people with more wealth, they had insurance, they had second homes, a lot of them could go to their rent controlled San Francisco apartments no one knew they had until, um, I digress, until um, till fires happen. So we know that communities have their own unique challenges and vulnerabilities and we talked about that. So Jen, why don't you talk about just that in context to your area and then we can come back around and maybe Michael address it and then mm -hmm. Kate. Sure. So um, similar to what you were just sharing, you know, we, we're in a, a wealthy, over-educated, under things to do with your time community, right? So, so there were a lot of folks who immediately had a resolution um, physically to, to help themselves. Um, 
But what we also had because of, you know, I think great schools, great amenities was a high rental population in our community, which I, I feel like we really didn't get right in terms of serving that community because those folks, many of them didn't have any insurance, didn't have the same resources that home builders, you know, folks that were going to go back to rebuild on their properties had. And so they, they kind of just dispersed out into the community. Many of them, we were able to keep track of them initially, but they moved to other parts of the country. Um, it, it, that will always feel like a failure to, to me in our recovery process. Um, but another area um, for those that actually have the resources when more things became available, those those folks still had a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, and upwards gap in their insurance payouts versus what their rebuild costs were going to be. But they wouldn't go get help. They wouldn't use the resources that were available. They were had uh, you know self assigned that this isn't for me. This is you know. Meanwhile, you know there's dola funds and there's money coming from the government. And so we had to really adjust the the campaign to get. It was really more of a, a psychological, um, you are in this position. You do need this help. You do need this support, and it's okay to go and get it. And so we had to, I think, for our community, really invest a lot more into the mental health support perspective, which um, maybe we can speak to you later, but we, we really were underfunded and under-resourced in that, in that area as well. Michael, because you were talking about the difference of your upper area, lower area, all lakefront all connected oh, to yeah. the lake, but you were talking about even that difference, but also anything else you'd yeah, like to expand I, on? Yeah, I think uh, in particular, I know I've got some uh, dear friends here uh, who represent the McKenzie River area in Oregon, which is a, just an amazing, amazing spot. If you get a chance, be sure to go by and visit at some point. Um, but to me, what's really stark when we talk about equity, it's, it's not always the obvious part. If you were to go up the McKenzie River today, and the river, as you go upstream, the river is on your right-hand side. And you see homes that have been rebuilt. You see some beautiful homes that have been rebuilt. And on the left-hand side, not so much. And if you dig a little deeper, what that is, it's people with the, that were closer to the fully insured, who had assets, and it's perhaps a second home. Um, those have been rebuilt. Uh, what we don't have for our school that's upriver are places for those families whose kids need to go to school and live up, upstream, those, those spots haven't been rebuilt yet. So for me, that highway represents a really stark reminder of disequity, inequity. Um, so it's something we need to keep working on and, and, and really get our recovery moving to help those other families. Um, so we, this is about inclusivity because I think it bounces right off of what Michael was saying. We know that resilience efforts should be inclusive and equitable. How do we ensure the vulnerable and the marginalized communities and people are not left behind in these initiatives? Yeah, that's, there's so much to that. That's a really big question. Um, I think uh, like for Campfire, um, you know, within our burn scar, we had so many different demographics that were affected and um, both Town of Paradise and the county jurisdictions around, um, they all have different uh, recovery needs. And so I think it's really making sure that we're mindful of what the unmet needs are for the community. I think what's, what sometimes gets missed is um, needing to uh, rebuild the social fabric that was in the burn scar in those different regions. Um, for example, like when, when I was uh, social working before the fire, um, a lot of my home visits were in the county jurisdictions. Um, really beautiful properties, very hard to get to, and um, usually inherited over generations. Um, and they were able to sustain that quality of life um, just uh, because of their social connections, their relationships with their neighbors and being able to trade and barter, there was a different type of commerce. Um, and so I think, I think when we go in and, and try to help rebuild, we have to also think about, um, it's not just replacing a person into a house, it's how are you replacing, replacing them back into a community. And I feel like that's been a lot of work in our case management system is not just looking at the physical needs, but the whole person and, and what they're going to need to be able to sustain living in, in a new, a potentially new home. Thank you. Uh, Jen, I wanted to ask you, you know, what strategies have you seen implemented or engaged communities, even communities that 
it's interesting enough, right, your perspective, like you had people who had resources and wouldn't even take advantage of resource. And then we have people who've been systematically and traditionally disenfranchised and can be reticent to also take advantage of that. So what are ways that you've seen or you can give ideas to engage communities in planning and the decision-making processes related to the climate resilience and soft infrastructure? So um, as a entity of Superior Rising, we had Superior Sundays, which was a weekly gathering, and um, we stayed consistent with that so folks just knew that every Sunday at this location there was going to be people, and there might be five or there might be 200, depending on um, what we had going on. But I think the because everyone gets scattered and information is all over the place, um, having a consistent um, location and, and time of the day that that was going to happen started to grow the reliability of that. Um, and those were the places where we would bring in speakers like Valerie from United Policyholders to answer questions because people were just getting into how to do their contents. And uh, so, you know, as each thing rose uh, as a highest issue for that time in the recovery, we would bring in people to answer the questions directly um, during that time. Um, we also held a builder expo, which was really amazing, where we brought like 30 builders into one location. So people, one, it was amazing to see neighbors that hadn't seen each other since the fire. So it's a very emotionally grounding and connecting. Some of those folks hadn't come back since, and, and this was a reason to bring them. Um, so any time there was an opportunity to be the anchor for data or information that was needed, um, we, we did that. And, and that seemed to help um, pretty well with keeping, keeping folks coming back. And food is always good. There was a lot of food at these things. Um, but yeah, I think just um, holding the consistent space so that the information could get into them was the, was the big thing. Thank you. Michael, I'm going to ask you about responsive governance, but before I do, in our conversation, and it's just, I'm looking at these round tables, and it reminds me of something in our conversation yesterday. I think it came from you, Kate. Can you just, I mean, sometimes there's big ideas, but sometimes it's just the simple things, the small things. Can you talk about that now that I'm seeing the round tables, what, how we talked about how that can even be a community builder? Yeah, um, so I, when we were talking yesterday, I brought up the example, um, as a survivor, and for survivors in the room, you know that you stand in lines, right? Lines are the thing, I, I, like get in line regardless. And um, and I was, myself, my family, um, we were all getting really tired of the line thing because it brings up a lot of those worries about scarcity and not getting access to what you need. Um, but one of the things that I learned was standing in line was um, it, uh, it was an opportunity for healing because what you ended up doing was talking to the people around you and um, talking about your, 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 your experience evacuating, um, you know, what you've lost, what you're feeling. And um, for, you know, for those of us that work you know, with people who have experienced trauma, we know that it takes about seven times to tell your story to be, begin to heal from it. And um, so, uh, you know, it, it wasn't actually until I, I got to see um, the lines form at, for the bear fire about a year later, um, I was able to witness what it looked like to ha see a line, and I saw the same stuff of people in, in, you know, panic and needing to tell their story, and I just thought, like, wow, this is an opportunity. We need to, like, not do lines. We need to do hubs and putting people in... in um, in, in spaces that will nurture those conversations and allow a sense of hospitality um, and, and utilize volunteers to come to those tables and act sort of as a concierge um, and, and make sure people, you, you, you know what, what needs are, are coming from those hubs and where they can go to get them. Um, and it would just kind of reduce the, um, that, that scarcity kind of feeling that you get when you're in line, so. <laughs> Michael. Uh, you know, one of the things we talked about this is responsive governance. And so can you talk a little bit about that? You know, we talked about that, how you really want to talk about building that connective tissue between state and local governments and how states can work best with local communities. Is that something that you can speak to today? Yeah, thank you. Um, quick sidebar, our, our youngest son was curious what would happen if he Googled my name with Oregon, and thankfully nothing scandalous. Um, there was the LinkedIn profile, and then he said, 
there's a really cool letter from, I think it's your friend in California who wrote to the governor and said, you got to continue this position. Um, thanks for that, Jen. Um, but I, that really spoke to, as Jen and I worked together, she said, you guys did something really unique in Oregon. And, and I, I come back to this because it's so important that those of you that are in, a, in emergency management, I respect and appreciate absolutely the positions you're in. But if your state is faced with the crisis that we were, which bridged eight counties and really much of Western Oregon, you have to take a different look to it. And you really have to challenge yourself and lean into those conversations. And so to have the position that I was lucky enough to have to really push state agencies to do the right thing, it's important to recognize they're not trying to do the wrong thing, but in disaster, they're going to default to being very cautious. And that's really what our communities can't afford at that point. So we have to take risks in recovery. And so I think that's really important. Whatever you call the position, whatever role it may play, but somebody with some degree of independence from state agencies to say, are we doing the right thing? This question, when I asked it to all of you, got some grunts, some moans. Um, but how do we measure success? Right, there's the quantitative and the qualitative, and very often for grants, you have to show impact. So how do we measure the success of these climate resilience efforts in our communities? Um, and also connected to soft infrastructure, but one is how do you tell the story, but then how do you actually know what you're doing is having the impact that you um, hope that it is, or that you're, you're saying that it is? So. I know that when I asked that question, also with how do you take care of yourself, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother panel. And I know that's coming later today, so we don't have to address that. But don't avoid this question. No one's picked up the mic, you can see. I'll go. But I'll go. how, how I'll go. do we quantify yeah. success? Yeah. I thought about this a lot after we talked about it. Um, and we actually, um, in our town, we set up a dashboard as quickly as we could. It was it felt too late for some folks, but it, it did come online where we were measuring the data of the debris cleanup by the lots, um, the permits applied for, the permits issued for rebuilding. Um, and now we're starting to see the numbers for the COs as people are moving back in. And we, as an elected official, one elected official at least, is always at the CO and we have a photo with the family and and so those, you know, it's a picture and some people might not value that highly, but it's a big deal to show up to that moment when they're able to move back to their their home. Um, but I think just being able to see those metrics put a, kept the pressure on the government and the permitting, the planning department to continue to find um, ways to move past any blocks that were coming up and kept a direct line to them because it was public, everyone could see it. And when it didn't move very much, people were going, why isn't this number moving? And so I think it was a really helpful um, way to see, see that data and keep the pressure on, um, which I would call that a success in itself, just um, you know, keeping that applied pressure um, overall. Michael's, oh, Michael and then we'll end with, Okay, so is it just somebody answers the phone? Is that a success for the day? You know, Boy, what is, what is uh, that's success? That's a great question. Um, I, I really, when we talked about this yesterday, I think given my perspective on a statewide basis, it's sometimes too easy to give communities, I shouldn't say easy to give communities credit for rebuild, but it doesn't fully recognize the difficulty in other areas. And so I don't, um, I don't, Personally, while I'm cognizant of what those numbers look like, it's really moving the needle and just recognizing the effort that's happening in some of these rural areas where it's just hard work um, every day to get a house or two up um, and to be able to say that is a win. So, um, yeah, you would think with my sort of global perspective, be like, oh, yeah, here are all the data points. And I, I tend not to like to do that. So thank you. And Kate, you know, you're coming from this social work perspective, right? So I'm sure there's a lot of data there, but it's, it's hard work too. How do, how do you know you've been successful? Yeah, I learned early on that the quantitative data um, felt very disappointing all the time. Like I always felt like, oh, there's, there could be more than more houses built or more, more cases opened or um, closed. And um, 
uh, I think I was kind of in the beginning of this work more, you know, skeptical and like there's always more to do. And I, um, I had a, a case manager come to me and, and she said, you know, that like how you react to things happening affects us all. And like, if you're excited, we're all excited too. And so I really quickly be became more mindful about appreciating the qualitative stuff. And so when I, every, for Campfire Collaborative, we hold a general meeting every two months and we typically have anywhere from 60 to 75 attendees at those meetings. And um, when I think about five years out, we still have that level of engagement. That's really exciting. And so like, I think if we, if, if we are looking at engagement as a su success, I feel really happy about that with, with our work. And um, also having uh, case managers that are still really committed to the work and enjoy it and are not burning out. Um, and, um, and ultimately survivors having a good experience, regardless if their cases um, reach full recovery or not. If they had a good experience and felt safety and trust with our services, then I feel like that's a success, so. Thank you, I'll just drop one last thing. I would have asked them all for a final, but we're at the end. One of the things that we wrapped up with is whoever is funding, don't parcel it out in little pieces. Understand this is a long term thing and if it's around mental health services or anything, don't give us just a year or months or amount of hours. Understand it's a long term thing and the people who do the work know how to spend the money. So just to finish with that, I wanna thank Jen Cowish, Kate Scowsmith, and Michael Mortar. It's been a pleasure to meet you and a pleasure to have this conversation today.